All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's Google Search Central SEO Office Hours Hangout. My name is John Mueller. I'm a search advocate at Google in Switzerland. And part of what I do are these Office Hour Hangouts, where people can join in and ask their questions around search. Uh, a bunch of questions have been submitted already, so we can go through some of those. But maybe we'll start with uh, some live questions first. And people have already been raising hands, so this is fantastic. Uh, let's start with uh, Danette. Hi. Um, I'm having some issues with the Google Search Console. Uh, we put the tags on our, a certain web page. And I tried to verify it with both analytics and with putting the tags on, and it still comes back unverified. And I'm just wondering where I can go from here. OK, so, so which tags did, did you use? Is like the, with the meta tag verification? The, anal uh, the analytic, just whatever it says in the Search Console. OK, and you use the, the, the analytics method to do the verification? I tried method. the analytics method to verify it. Uh, it's been a while since we logged into uh, analytics with the particular account. Uh, and it said to upgrade to version 4. And I did that. And it seemed like it gave some more stuff. And I've tried working with the software. So it's, it's a third-party software, ISU Raw Teradata software. And they've said that they've put the tags in the right place, to their knowledge. I've tried working with, I work at a university. I tried working and saying, hey, we don't, we don't want to deal with this because don't, don't ask, basically, don't ask us, ask your father. And I've already asked my father, you know. OK. Um, I, I suspect what you're running into is uh, with, with the new version of Google Analytics, we don't automatically pick that up for verification in Search Console. Uh, so basically, by by shifting over to GA4, uh, that makes it so that you have to use a separate method for verification in Search Console, uh, which could be maybe the meta tag is something that's possible to implement. Maybe the the file itself is, is an option there, uh, but the Google Analytics method wouldn't work automatically. Well, then. I've tried the, the the option number one, the HTML file, <laughs> adding that, and it still doesn't work. OK. Um, I, I would almost recommend maybe posting in the help forum for that okay. uh, with, with the URL of your site and the URL of that, that file uh, so that someone can take a look and see if, if there's something specific to point at. Because it sounds like you're doing things right. And okay. I, I feel it's probably something very small that is, is just kind of like blocked Got it. somehow. Uh, so it's in the Search Console forum, or where? Yes. Where? yes. Um, Do you have a specific link you can put in the chat, maybe? Sure, sure. Um, there's a short link. I think this should work. Um, OK, let's see. OK, um, I got it. I th OK, I'll try doing that. And you're saying that like Google personnel monitor that and s or someone else can help. There are, there are different people who, who are quasi experts on the product who, who can help with that. It's not specifically someone from Google, but uh, they can escalate it to someone from Google if there are issues on Google's side. OK, all right. That's all I have need. Thank you very much, John. Cool. Thanks. All right, Michael. Hi, John. Um, very quick question, just because it's top of mind, and I haven't uh, researched it. But um, we have, we're developing very long content, comprehensive kind of um, copy to address uh, a particular search. And uh, we were thinking of adding anchor links at the top, kind of like a, na a navigation menu further down, um, which would you know, make our quick answer not necessarily at the top of the page. Um, because we would have these kind of anchor links at the top. Um, do you think that has will have any impact on um, how we search up, how we uh, show up for quick answers or our ability to rank for those? I don't think that would affect anything. I, I mean, it probably makes it easier for users to get to that content, which is, mm -hmm. is kind of a good thing. But I don't think it would negatively affect anything from, from an SEO point of view. OK. Great, thank you. Sure, cool. Uh, Jason. 
Cool. Hi, John. Um, so when we look at our server logs, we see generally two hits from Googlebot at the same time or, you know, give or take a few milliseconds, right? Um, my team has been trying to figure out an explanation for this, and we even have a bit of a pool going, right? One believes that it's hitting our server from different physical locations, right? Uh, another, you know, thinks that it could be desktop versus mobile. My money is on raw HTML versus rendered HTML. Did I back the right horse? I don't know. Is that, I mean, what, what are you seeing? Is it the same URL and the same, same user URL. agent and mm -hmm. everything? It, is it the same user agent as well? It or? is. Yeah. That seems like something that shouldn't be happening. But because, I mean, if it, if it were desktop and mobile, those would be different user agents. And if it's the same Googlebot user agent, then we should be caching that a little bit. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be that like, w within seconds we would refresh the same page again. Uh, even if we were to render the page, we would use kind of the, the HTML version that we have, and then we render the page pulling in all of the, the extra content. We wouldn't render the page by fetching the HTML again, because that would be ki kind of inefficient. So that feels like mo almost more like a bug on our side, if you're seeing that. Or maybe you're seeing something in the logs that is simplified uh, or, or tracking it slightly differently. I don't know. Uh, but if, if it's the same URL, same user agent, like within seconds, that's, that seems uh, like an issue on our side. Uh, different physical locations wouldn't be the case because we usually crawl sites from the same location. Uh, so it's not that we would crawl it like once from this data center, once from a different one. Uh, we, we essentially pick one location and we crawl the whole site from that location. OK, so that's interesting because, I mean, if in our consumer experience, we use you know, uh, the, the location to kind of you know, uh, to serve up more relevant content. So that, that could mean that we could be limiting the amount of content accessible to Googlebot if you're only crawling it from one location, yes? Almost certainly, yes. Yeah. That's good to know. I, oh, another thing that might be happening there is um, I, I've seen this sometimes with uh, CDNs or security setups where essentially we request the URL once and it does a kind of a redirect back to the same URL or something like that uh, as, as an, I don't know, an anti-bot measure or something like that uh, where maybe we're, we're following a redirect like that and kind of indirectly picking up the content. And that would be something where I'd say if, if that's actually happening, if you can tell, for example, with the inspect URL tool when you do a live request, uh, that that kind of bouncing through your server is happening, that seems like something that would be inefficient on your side, where you'd probably be able to get more crawls in if you didn't have that kind of indirection in between. Makes sense. Cool. Thank you. Sure. All right, uh, Xiao. Hey, John. Uh, so my question is that um, I wonder how do Google will interpret the URL that is modified using uh, uh, window.history.push state. So basically, what they do is that they, they exchange your URL without redirect uh, display on the browser. Uh, do Google consider the content as the URL before? modifies or after modifies associated. Yeah, we we would generally if 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 that happens during the page load, for example, uh, then we would see that that as a redirect. And it it's a bit tricky always with redirects, like which which URL we would take into account and use for indexing because we we use different things for canonicalization. Um, but if, if we see that happening during the page load, we would assume that you're trying to say, oh, actually index it as this URL. And we would treat it as that. If, if that's something that only happens when you click a button or you click on a link or something like that, uh, then we probably wouldn't see that at all because we don't process those, those events. I see. So, uh, so it's, it's in JavaScript, so they only 
do that after they parse the JavaScript, right? So in this case, but but yeah. it, it automatically do that when people go to that page. In this yeah. case, you consider the after modified URL to be associated with the content. Yeah, yeah. Would you recommend not doing that? I uh, maybe redirect is better. I, I I think if you can do a server side redirect, it always saves resources because we don't have to render it. Uh, but it, it kind of depends on why why you're doing that. If if you're trying to do a redirect, then I would try to do a redirect as clean as possible. If it's something like like a page that uh, has um, infinite scroll or something where you're loading like the next article when one page loads, then obviously that's a little bit of a different situation, and maybe you need to make sure that you're not changing the URL when when the page is loading uh, for Googlebot. Uh, so. From that point of view, it kind of depends on why you're doing this. So is that uh, so? So from what you say, that uh, the push state is a uh, um, a method to can canonicalize uh, the content. However, would would so in this case, like redirect is superior than push state, right? But how about canonicalization? Yes. Is that which one is superior? In so for canonicalization, I don't think anyone is better than the other one. But uh, the server-side redirect is something we process immediately. And push state is something where we have to read the JavaScript first, mm -hmm. uh, which means it takes longer for us to get there. So if, if you want to do a redirect, the server-side redirect is, is like the fastest way you can get us to process that. I see. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, Rajiv. Hey, John. Yeah. So uh, I have a quick question. Yeah, so just wanted to ask, so we were having a debate about if infinite scroll is better or pagination is better. Yeah. So I got just one question. So if we implement uh, infinite scroll on our website, so basically the block category pages or the blocks itself, so they will be in continuation to each other. Like, so will it increase the page size or is there any way like uh, by how it can impact our page speed or performance? Um... Sure. I mean, it it can increase the page page size. I I would see it more as almost a usability question. And for for some some sites, maybe it makes sense to have something like pagination. Uh, for other sites, maybe it makes sense to have kind of an infinite stream of articles uh, where you can go from one to the next one. I I think those are both legitimate approaches and. Uh, th both of those are things that you can do in a way that work well for SEO. Uh, so it's it's something where I I would almost focus on what you want to do from a usability point of view, and then as a second step, think about what do I need to do with that selection to make sure it works well for SEO. Okay, got it. Thanks, John. Sure. Uh, Alster. Hi, John. How are you? Hi. Good to see you. Um, so uh, I've got a question about either uh, removing old content or, um, or, or keeping it. Uh, we've got a website with about 9,000 news pages in the, in the news section. And we've got about 500 articles in like the, the core subcategories of the site. And um, I was wondering, um, would there be any consequences if we sort of stop producing content for the news pages and you know instead um, divert our efforts to like the main articles on the website which bring in the most traffic I, I I think that's almost like a strategic question it's less of something where I'd say that there's an SEO effect that you would see there I mean obviously if you stop producing content and you just have older content in one part of your website then that part of your website won't be Visible as much for kind of newer type queries, um, but that you you only have limited resources and you have to focus your work on on something. Uh, so if if you decide that the other part of your website is more important, that brings in more visitors or more revenue or whatever, then focusing your efforts there, I think, is is a perfectly legitimate decision. Perfect. That's brilliant. And um, so so. If we just left them alone, then it it shouldn't really make the um, 
make a big difference because I mean the other option is like removing the like seven thousand pages which don't get any traffic at all, and um, and obviously if we like uh, if we consider about you know the broken links and um, and setting up the correct redirects, um, I do think that would be a better option just getting rid of the content. Um, I I mean if if when you look at it you say it's bad content then it's perhaps worthwhile to get rid of it. Uh, but if you look at it and you you essentially think, well, it's it's reasonable content. It's just not a lot of traffic there. Then I, I think that's fine to keep as well. Uh, so it's it's not the case that just because something is old or just because something has less traffic that it's automatically bad content. That's it. Thank you. Um, I have two more questions, but before I ask them. Um, a question, which is, how many questions can I ask in a row? Um, uh, a, a couple is fine, as long as we, we don't spend the whole hour uh, on the questions, yeah. Of course. Thank you. Um, so another question is, um, uh, when creating informational content, um, what do you think would be best over the long run? Um, should we be creating? You know, like ultimate guides. You know, we see with like Backlinko, where it's like keyword research, and then they have like an ultimate guide which covers the who, what, where, and why of that. Or do you think it'd be better to maybe just niche down in each particular question, like why is keyword research important, or um, how to do keyword research? What What's your advice for that? I I think it's it's almost like a strategic decision there as well where uh, it, you can target kind of the the head queries and uh, if if you have something really good if your website is really strong in that area then I I could see how that can attract a lot of traffic but at the same time for the more tail queries often there's less competition and it's easier to be visible so you might uh, have kind of less overall traffic, but it's easier to rank there and it's easier to grow there. So usually the, the way I, I look at it for, especially for newer sites, smaller sites, sure. is kind of get started with the tail queries and kind of build up uh, from there. Because you also learn with that what, what kind of content resonates well with your audience. You kind of grow into that situation. Whereas if you spend a lot of time creating this head content and it doesn't get any visibility, then it's a lot of work that you put into that, and you don't get a lot of value out of that. At least with the tail things, you incrementally get more and more out of that. That makes sense. Thank you. And uh, the last question, and uh, I know it's probably not your favorite one. I'll take my gray hat off. Uh, but uh, what what does large scale article market what does large-scale article marketing or guest post campaigns with keyword-rich anchor text links mean? Um, I, I suspect that's from, from the Webmaster Guidelines somewhere. Mm -hmm. It uh, sounds like it, yeah. Um, I mean, it, it's something where so sometimes we see sites in engaging in something like that where they're uh, creating a large amount of very similar content and trying to spread that as broadly as possible. And essentially, with, with that content, if, if it's, for example, guest post, you're posting it on other people's websites, uh, it's, it's essentially artificial links pointing to your website. And uh, what we're trying to say there is we, we really want to see sites kind of get recognized in a natural way on the web and not in a way where it's like you're putting all of those links out there, but rather other people are saying, well, this is actually good content, and they link to you instead. Uh, so I don't know. That's very simplified. That, that, that's really helpful. So like, uh, so, so, it, so instead of um, you know, manually building links, you just want to like produce lots of good content and then and, and get that to, to rank over the long term. And, and um, but but what if you like you're building guest posts on a large scale for like huge publications which are relevant like Healthline or or Forbes with non keyword rich, albeit like relevant anchor text that could um, that that might be able to help our site. Do you think? Um, 
I, I think for, for the most part, when, when the WebSAM team runs across something like that, they would see that as unnatural links and try to uh, kind of, I don't know, d diffuse that almost in, this, in the sense that they want to make sure those links don't count. Uh, so that's, from, from my point of view, doing something along those lines to drive awareness to your website is fine. Uh, but then the link should be no followed. And uh, it, essentially, if you're bringing your expertise to, to a broader audience, if you're showing them, like, here is something really smart that I put together, and you can find out more information on my website, and that link is no followed, it's, it's kind of like almost like an advertising for your website. And if it's no follow, people can still click there and go to your, visit your website. And in the end, if they think, oh, this is actually good content, I'll recommend it to other people, then they can link to your content. Uh, but that initial link that you're pointing to your content that you're placing yourself, uh, that's at least not passing any signals. So that's, that's kind of the way that we would see it. Like Obviously, just going out and creating great content is, is one thing. But if nobody knows about that content, Nobody's going to be able to recommend it. So you almost have to do some amount of initial uh, kind of marketing or promotion for your content. Uh, but that initial marketing and promotion that you do doesn't have to have um, kind of normal followed links to your content. Fantastic. You've been brilliant. Thank you so much. Cool. Thanks. Uh, Daniel. Hey, how's it going? Hi. A uh, couple of questions. One's a general and one's specific. Um, so the first one really is, I asked this question a couple of weeks ago, um, just uh, shared two URLs again uh, in the chat. So the first site is the original site, um, and then migrating to the staging site. Um, and we spoke uh, about if we had links in the navigation verse on page and did the kind of impact that would have uh, against link equity and that being dispersed. So, so the good news is they are going to keep the exact same URLs and the new site versus the old site. Um, so the, the structure there is going to be the same. But my concern now is the placement, the link placement. So you'll notice in the first URL, the first domain, we've got the collections and the pages URLs. It's a bit of a mix, mainly for slash pages. Both for slash pages and for slash collections get a lot of visibility across the two. But in the new site, it's only collections in the navigation and the forward slash pages as being moved to the A to Z page, which you'll see top right hand corner next to the what's next. So, so my main concern now is the link placement. Now that we've got the forward slash pages being removed out of the navigation onto the A to Z, um, I kind of wanted some advice. So you can see the new site's much cleaner. It's it's more of a mega menu now. It, it's got more URLs. It's going to be better for the UX. But my concern now is if we go live with that, the, the all the visibility that forward slash pages uh, URLs get, we, we'll lose it, and we'll you know we'll lose it also, and we'll have a a bit of volatility in ranking. So so I feel like the only way to mitigate that is to have or trying to, to replicate, again, what's in the existing site to the new site, which has got a lot less URLs and has a mix of pages uh, and collections. But I kind of wanted to get your advice on that, because we don't want to lose any visibility. Um, and the, the current the, kind of the current site is, yeah, that's just that's, that's, that's something that's been around for years, and we've just been bolting on and adding on and, and stuff like that. So yeah what 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 would be the best course of action if we didn't want to lose visibility across the forward slash page URLs and the forward slash collections if they are getting removed from their navigation if that makes sense yeah i i don't know i i would almost have to take a look at at the site in in detail but it, it's always very tricky to kind of judge what what would happen in a case like this, I mean, it's it's always if you're changing the internal navigation and things are moving around, then you're kind of changing the the weighting of of the mm -hmm. elements on your site and what you want to kind of see as being the the most important on the site, uh, and that's some, sometimes a bit tricky, especially if you have things like mega menus or just generally bigger menus. Uh, where when when you initially look at it, it's hard to tell what is actually a link in the HTML or not. 
or what what the actual structure there is. So that's something where if, if you're changing the actual structure of the internal linking, that would almost certainly affect things from an SEO point of view. Uh, but uh, it could also affect things in a positive way, where it's, it's hard to say, like, I don't want this part of my site to drop, but at the same time, I want everything else to rise. Essentially, you're, you're shuffling things around always. You're, you're kind of like taking something from here and putting it here. You're not like keeping everything here and then adding five more here uh, if you're just sh shifting things around on the website. And that shuffling between different parts of your website, that's something that you can do strategically as well, where you can think about, well, what, what do I really care about with this website? Where do we make the most money? Where do we think we have the best content that we want to promote? Maybe where is the most competition where we need to put more weight so that we can compete properly? And uh, those are all things where you're kind of taking from one part of the site and kind of moving it a little bit to the other part uh, by changing mm -hmm. the internal link. And uh, that's, that's sometimes really tricky to look at just from like, manually looking at the site. You probably need to almost crawl the site uh, with, mm -hmm. with a tool like, I don't know, Screaming Frog or something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. and then look at, I, I think they have some, some kind of a, um, the end links or oh, oh, the tree, the map. I think you're referring that, that to map, that map. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, where yeah, you yeah. kind of see like everything is is rotated around here. Everything is kind of split into these sections, and usually with that you can kind of see before and after. It's like everything was rotated around this part of the site, and now it's shifted over here, and mm. then you can kind of evaluate. Well, is is that what I want, or is it not okay. what I want? I'll give that a go then. Uh, I think um, if we were to be safe, maybe the important forward slash page URLs we would insert into the navigation and then kind of figure out or wait till post migration and then pull them out. Um, but yeah, we can have a look. It's 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 a handy tip actually to have a look at that site yeah. architecture just using the screen frog. Okay, I'll have a look at that. Um, and this is just more of a general question as well. So obviously, it was obviously seen as, as a lot in the, I guess, industry news around the, the title tags and, and SERPs. And, and now Google is doing more of taking the H1 tag or at least on page content and kind of replacing that. So my question is, is Google moving away from using title tag as more of a, a, a weighted factor now? Or have they already done that? Because again, we. We, we optimize title tags to make sure it's descriptive and it, it makes sense. But if Google's not really using it as a ranking factor, is there any point? So I was just wondering if, if, if that's a step in that direction and moving away from the reliance of title tags. I, rank, as rank yeah, I, I don't know what, what the future will bring. But uh, it, uh, at least at the do. moment, it's not, <laughs> it's not the case that we're saying title tags are irrelevant. Uh, they they still matter for search. They do matter for for rankings yeah. as well. Uh, so even if our systems uh, kind of rewrite something, then it's it's not the case that we would say your page is irrelevant for what you had as a title tag. We would still mm. use that for search. Okay. Okay. That's that's good then. Yeah. Thank I you. Mean, I mean, I I really don't know which which direction things will go there. I I suspect mm -hmm. with with all of the feedback that we've gotten around title tags, what, what will happen is we'll do a, a bunch of iterations in the algorithms, which on the one hand, I think will make things better. On the other hand, SEOs will always be like, oh, no, more changes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, hopefully, there'll be reasonable changes or changes that, that you all think make sense as well. Um, yeah. there, there was also a little bit talk about having some kind of opt-out meta tag or something like that. I, I don't know. Per personally, I, I don't see that happening, at least not in the near future, uh, because it's, it's also something that we, we didn't really need in the past as well. And making a setting just because the algorithm currently is maybe a little aggressive in that direction, that seems like the wrong approach, because it should be something we should improve in the algorithm, not rely on an extra setting to, to get yeah, it handled. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. It's like we, we keep getting feedback, and that feedback is super helpful. And we, we'll see what we have to do to make sure that things align, that they work well for users, and that they work well for the sites as well.
Okay. If this is here to stay and, and I guess it gets rolled out across everything, I might ask this question again in the future. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, here to, like nothing is here to stay. It's like the web is, yeah. is like what, what, like 15 years old now? It's yeah. like yeah. It, it's changing all the time. So uh, I. It's evolution. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's always in motion. No worries. It, it, no, I appreciate the answer on that. It just gives me and, and my team a, a bit of guidance. And yeah, we, we just were unsure. You know, it's something we've been doing for years, I think, as, as a lot of SEOs. And is it a case we need to stop focusing on that as more and, and, and focus on different areas? But it seems like it's, it's still, you're still using it for relevancy as such. So, yeah. so we'll kind of continue doing what we're doing. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that. Cool. I appreciate the honesty. Thanks. OK, um, I, I see there's still a bunch of hands raised, but I need to also get through some of the submitted questions. So I'll jump to some of the submitted ones for the moment and get back to the people who are raising hands afterwards. Also, I'll have a bit more time after this session uh, for anything that's remaining. Uh, let's see. If we have links pointing to all category pages in the main navigation, th is there any benefit uh, for SEO if we put a second link to some of them from the main content? Uh, I don't think there's really a, a big benefit from an SEO point of view. If you add an additional link to the same page within that page, uh, sometimes we can get more information from, from the anchor text if like, the initial anchor text is very uh, short or not very descriptive, then a more descriptive one can help. Uh, but there's also no downside there. So if you're adding extra links in the main content for usability reasons, that's, that's perfectly fine. That's something that I think definitely makes sense. Um, what would be an ideal product description length for e-commerce sites offering quite technical products? Uh, does the length of the product description influence how these pages rank at all? Um, I don't know. You won't like the answer, but it, it depends. Uh, it's something where, essentially, you can use whatever you want as a description. And some sites don't even provide any description at all. Uh, they essentially leave it completely to Google or, or search engines to figure out what the description should be. Um, but it's, it's something that's, that's very unique to each individual site. And the length that they supply there, that can vary. It's also the case that in the search results, the length that we show varies quite a bit. Sometimes we show something very short, sometimes maybe two lines, sometimes maybe even four lines or longer in, in the snippet in the search results. So it's not the case that there is this one number that you need to target. And regarding ranking, it doesn't change ranking at all. So you can supply whatever you want there. Um, the, the other thing. Maybe to keep in mind here is just the snippet that we show is not just the description in the meta tag. It can also be something from the page. And it can vary depending on the query. So uh, that's a little bit, on the one hand, similar to titles in that it, it, uh, it can be from the page. But it's different from titles in the sense that it can vary depending on the query. Um, then more title tag talk. Um, we wondered if we change the page title tag to match what Google is now dynamically selecting uh, in the HTML, would this negatively affect SEO? Uh, ultimately, we want to know if the HTML title tag would still add SEO benefit, even if it was not being selected for display. I, I think we touched upon this briefly. It's, it still matters. The title tag still works for ranking purposes. Uh, changing it to what Google has selected from, from my point of view, doesn't automatically make sense. Because just because one algorithm selects something as a title doesn't mean it's a better title. Uh, but maybe there are cases where Google's algorithms have selected a better title and where it makes sense to kind of go in that direction. Uh, but there are certainly also situations where maybe Google's algorithms select the, a worse title and where you want to keep the one that you had there, or maybe you even want to improve the one that you had previously. So I wouldn't just blindly use what we show in search and say that's got to be the best title because Google's algorithms know everything better. And it's not the case that Google's algorithms know everything better. But can I just add to that? Is that OK? Sure. So basically, when you guys change it to uh, when you guys change it from let's say from you know 
A, B, C, one, two, three, and then I go ahead and make the change because I, I don't like what the algo uh, did choose. It, it takes uh, quite a long time for it to update um, than before. What's going on with that? So long time ago, it took about 20 seconds uh, for bot to go ahead and, and update it. Now, days, maybe like weeks. So is there an issue on why that's happening? When I go and fetch the new title tag, it it, it won't, it doesn't take, um, you know, it's not as fast as it used to be, John. That's all I'm saying. I don't have anything against that. It's probably the know. new infrastructure or. I, I don't think, I don't think there's any kind of built-in latency there. Uh, so. I've tried it with many sites. I've tried it with, you know, um, 10,000 web pages. I've tried it with a small and pop shop. I, it, it takes a long time for it to update. In terms of like, so so let's say right now I made a title change and I go and submit it to, uh, and I go and fetch it. Wait, then the, you know, the, the security thing pops up, you put it in and then you wait and you wait and uh, I don't see the change, so. I, I mean, it's it's something where we don't guarantee that we actually go off and re-index the page when you submit it there. So that's that's something that always plays a little bit of a role there. But I've I've seen reports online where, where people are making title tag changes and they're reflected fairly quickly. Um, I don't know the what is it WordStream for example on their blog they had an example there where they're like oh Google changed our title tag to something that we don't like. And they went off and changed some things on their pages, and uh, that got picked up within, I don't know, a day or so. I, I don't know yeah, what yeah, the timing there was. I mean, yeah, so I mean, a day is fine. I'm just saying, but before, back in the day, it used to be much faster. So there's probably. I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if, if the titles are, are specifically slower, but that shouldn't be the case. And uh, kind of indexing is something that differs extremely by site, from site to site. And uh, for, for some sites and some pages, we, we go off and re-index things very quickly. And other sites, it, it just takes a lot longer. And uh, it's I, I think with regards to titles as well, uh, things like the, the site title that we have, where we try to figure out what, what the title of the site is, that's something that does have a bit of latency there. Uh, because we we kind of assume that sometimes not all titles on on a website have kind of the brand mentioned. So if we don't see the brand mentioned, we say, oh, we should add the brand there as well because that's what users want to see. And if you're trying to change that brand name or remove that from the title there, then that can sometimes take a bit of time. Yeah, like I'm I'm okay with it. It's just. Uh... You know, I'm adjusting to what's happening uh, on your end, and I understand that, like what you guys are going through. So, it's just that's the way it is. And yeah, no, I'm okay with it. Okay. Now, I mean, it's it's good feedback to have for the team that if you want to make changes quickly, then it it's annoying if you have to wait. Yeah, if a client calls and says, "Hey, you know, uh, you, this and this," or the development team, you know, what's going on? How long is this going to take till the change? I mean, there's some. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, got it. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see. Next question here. I've been consistently publishing content on my website. Oh no, this is essentially the same question that you had. Uh, it's like my new articles are not being treated by Google like my early articles, not being indexed as quickly. What What can I do? Um, yeah, I. I think it's it is something that uh, that you have to grow from over time, especially if it's a relatively new site. Then it it does take a bit of time for Google's algorithms to pick up on that and to kind of crawl very quickly and, and frequently uh, on content that you're adding, and especially when it comes to new content that you're producing on a website, we do take into account things like the overall quality that we've seen of a website over time. And if it's a relatively new website, maybe we don't have that much context there with regards to the quality. Uh, if it's something older and you're seeing that Google is just not picking up new content, then I would try to take a step back and think about what you can do to really make it clear that this is really high quality content 
and that you don't have this mix of kind of high quality, low quality content there. Uh, so that's kind of my, my advice there. And with regards to new content not being indexed quickly, it's not that the new content is maybe of questionable quality. It's really the overall existing content. So that's kind of one, one thing to watch out for there. Uh, if my website is in Wix or Shopify, for example, and they mess up the hreflang implementation, and I get a 503 error and get deranked, uh, it's not in our control. Is there any way to get recrawled faster after the fix has been implemented? Uh, so I, I think there are a few things here which, which are kind of being combined here. On the one hand, if you're using a platform and something on that platform goes wrong, we see that as an issue on your website. We don't go off and say, oh, they're using a platform, and they, they can't help it if that platform is doing something wrong. Uh, so it's not the case that we would say, oh, the, the website doesn't have anything to do with this. It's like we, we should act like as if the website is doing everything perfectly, even though it's not working for us. Uh, we, we do see it as something that is on the website itself. So that's, that's maybe the first thing. Uh, with regards to technical issues in general, that gets resolved fairly quickly, uh, especially the larger platforms are extremely well set up for these kind of technical issues. And the ones that you mentioned there are ones where, at least from what I've seen, are doing fantastic work with regards to kind of the, the quality of the technical infrastructure that they have. Uh, the, the other thing that's mentioned here is the hreflang implementation. Um, hreflang is not a ranking factor, so it would not affect the ranking of your website. Uh, so that's may maybe something else to, to kind of throw into that mix there. So my, my general advice here is if, if you're seeing something like this happening, that your website is dropping in ranking, uh, then I wouldn't focus on those specific things that you mentioned there. So not the hreflang, uh, not a temporary server error, not that it's, it's hosted on some popular provider or something like that, but rather think about what might be happening on your website with regards to your general content overall uh, that could be affecting ranking there. Uh, because if these are technical errors, then we would remove those pages from search. Uh, then it wouldn't be a ranking issue, but rather an indexing issue. Uh, and usually, that gets picked up fairly quickly once, once any technical issue is resolved. Uh, so I, I think there are kind of a few things mixed in here. And it's, it's hard to have a clear answer on what you should be focusing on here. What I would recommend is if all of this is throwing you off completely and you're not sure what is actually happening, uh, the next time you see an issue like this, go off and post in the help forum and include the details. So uh, which of your URLs are affected? What specific issue are you seeing? Which queries are you seeing a change in ranking for? And uh, oftentimes, the, the folks that help out in the help forums, uh, they can take a look and at least help you to rule out certain things. And maybe there is something on the provider side that they need to change. but by kind of ruling out some of the, the more general issues, you have something more specific that you can go to the provider for and say, like, hey, this, this specific thing is broken, and I, I think you should fix it, or you should help me to find out how to fix it myself. There's a great saying from one of your podcasts. Uh, I think it, it's, uh, it's about Google's not a magazine. Google's a library. So treat it that way. And yeah, going back to the site and looking at the content, changing it is, uh, is what yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, let's see. Next question. Does a page index but blocked by robots text? Is that counted for the overall site quality? Uh, in general, no. So on, on the one hand, we don't know what the content is. So we can't take that into account. On the other hand, if it's blocked by robots text, then almost certainly it won't appear in the search results anyway. So that's something, e even from there, we would not be able to take into account. So from, from my point of view, that usually wouldn't be something that we would take into account. Also, if the page is no index, then it's also not indexed. We wouldn't have the, the content in our index. We wouldn't be showing it in search. So there's nothing really to take into account in, in a case like that. 
Uh, what's the benefit in getting greener with regards to Core Web Vitals? We have most of our site in the green, but would like to understand what's the value of making the scores even faster. Um, probably nothing. So at least from an SEO point of view, uh, if you're already in the green, like in, I don't know what it's called, good or OK, uh, in the individual metrics for the Core Web Vitals, and you're seeing that from the real user metrics as well, uh, then essentially, from, from an SEO point of view, from a ranking point of view, we would not be changing anything if you get even better than that. Uh, however, when, when it comes to things like real user metrics, it is something where you always have this variance of uh, speeds and uh, kind of metrics that we see from users. And if you make sure that your data is kind of even more in the green, then it'll be a little bit more stable in the green when it comes to the, the field data that is actually used in Search Console. So that's something where you're kind of making it more certain that we're seeing your site as being good. Uh, but it's not the case that if you like save another five milliseconds, you will see any kind of a ranking effect based on that. Uh, of course, until you reach that, that amount, you, you would see some changes there. But if you're already in the green, then you, you're doing a lot of things really well. Uh, the, the other effect there that you might see is just like the non-SEO effect. If users are seeing that your site is fantastic in, with regards to loading and interaction usability, then that's something where you might see some, some indirect effects, that they spend more time on your site or recommend it more. And that's, that's always a good thing, too. Uh, but that's not a direct like SEO ranking point, point of view thing. Um, let's see. A bunch of questions still left. But we're kind of running low on time. So let me get back to some of the people that are raising hands here. Uh, let's see. Contact mentor. Hey, John. Uh, yeah, so uh, first of all, thank you for your question, answer you had given me. like. Uh, last to last conference so that I was able to fix it out regarding that rank thing. And I have three quick questions. So uh, first question is uh, regarding um, crawl stats for not for errors. In the sense, not for not for errors that are uh, broken links that are on the page or the uh, errors that are there on the Google. Like In the sense, they are not the broken links that any user can access. But certain old links, which are no longer indexed, but uh, the crawl board uh, comes back to kind of index it, and it gets a 404. Does those errors affect uh, the ranking? So that is my question. No. So if, if these are old links that are no longer on your site, they, they definitely wouldn't be affecting the ranking. It's, it's very normal for a website when we crawl it to, to have a lot of 404 errors just from old URLs that we know about that maybe don't have any content anymore. And that's that's perfectly fine. OK, so uh, another is actually like, uh, so I was planning to add an interstitial about my own website in my articles, for example. So like, uh, I know that interstitials can affect, inter intrusive interstitials can affect rankings. So what if I add industrial after like 20 seconds, uh, user has like interacted with the page. Are those OK? Um, to, to some extent, that I, I think is fine. I, I think from a user point of view, those are still annoying. Uh, so I personally, I would recommend trying to find an approach where you can do something more like a banner and use that rather than an interstitial. Uh, but if it's something where a user is interacting with your page, they've scrolled to the bottom, for example, and then you show an interstitial, that, that could be fine. There is also a matter of the, the CLS, uh, the cumulative layout shift, which could also be affected by an interstitial like this. Uh, so that's something you, you might want to double check. So how about a uh, footer, fixed footer? Like those are fine, right? Which Usually that's good. fine. Yeah, usually that's fine. Like some, something like a small banner in the footer or something like that. Uh, that's, that's usually fine. Uh, I, I would still test yeah. with regards to especially cumulative layout shift. 
so, sometimes some implementations of interstitials are a bit tricky in that regard. Okay, so last question is uh, like I have certain tools like Microsoft Clarity or uh, Crazy Egg where I can like check how user is interacting uh, with my website. So like uh, when you say good user experience of article, like how what is exactly like is it is is it uh, in terms of like how much time they spend in my uh, article or do they read full article or like in what way is i can see whether it's a good user experience or not so it it depends quite a bit on what you think people should be doing on your website so that's something where i i don't think we would have one metric where we say this is the one that you need to look at. Uh, because some types of content people can glance at briefly, and they, they get the information they need, and they can move on. Uh, other types of content you really want them to read to the bottom, or maybe click on a call to action button, or sign up, or buy something. And uh, that's, that's very different. And that's something where, from, from a usability point of view, you can look at that to some extent, but you also need to look at the big picture of what, what you really want people to do on your website. Uh, so that's, I, I think, with, with a lot of these tools, with Google Analytics as well, there are just so many different options in there that it's, it's tempting to say, like, I will pick this one metric and use it for everything. Uh, but Usually, that doesn't make sense. Usually, you really have to find something that works for individual parts of your website or specific to individual websites, even. So in the sense, you're saying if someone is searching uh, what is JavaScript, like example, then if they just read the definition and go away, that is also a good user experience. I, I mean, we. It's not that we would use this as a ranking factor anyway. It's more about you recognizing when people are happy with your content or when you think you need to change something with your content. Uh, so I, I wouldn't see that as something that is like a pure SEO thing to do, but more as like you, you have some goals that you want to achieve with your website. And how, how can you guide users to, to do that? Yeah, thank you, John. And thank you for answering the questions. Sure. Um, Baruch, I think you were next, and you kind of dropped up and down. Yeah, just I guess when I'm speaking, and uh, the my hand w uh, disappeared. So uh, here's the situation. Uh, when you're working uh, with a team of 20 developers, uh, one hates it. The one likes one guy, the other, you know, and there's a lot of, like, drama. Um, and you're getting all the warnings from the core vitals, and just in general, the new page experience, which I I love, uh, the new design that you guys did, and it's just amazing. And um, so, the core vital warnings, um, you leave it one week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, just to sit there. Uh, how important uh, are they uh, to to just go ahead and make the changes? Because there's other things that they're working on, and then here come these warnings. What do you do? And then, yeah, like, is it? I don't even want to get into that question, but is it a ranking factor? But, you know, in this Hangout, many people ask you that question. Yeah, I, I mean, we use the, the Core Web Vitals as a part of the page experience uh, right. ranking factor. So that is a ranking factor. Uh, that is something that we take into account. Uh, but at the same time, it doesn't replace everything else. So we, we have a lot of different ranking factors. And you don't have to do everything perfect for all ranking factors to rank well. I, I don't think any site really does everything perfect. Uh, so it's. It's something where you can do really well in this part of kind of search and still rank fairly highly, or you can do really well in another part of search and rank very highly. It's not the case that you have to do everything all the time. And I, I think that makes it a little bit better for those sites that don't really know what they should be focusing on, because sometimes just focusing on anything kind of helps move the needle forward a little bit. 
sometimes having information on what you could be focusing on, which is kind of like what Search Console is giving you there, uh, is, is useful if you don't know what you should be focusing on or what you could be focusing on. Uh, with regards to whether you should do like everything for Core Web Vitals or kind of leave it alone and do other things, I, I don't think there is one, one answer that kind of works for everything. Uh, it's, it's also something where, personally, when, when I look at something like this, I would try to look at the, the metrics overall and see if it's kind of reasonable in the sense that when users get there, it's like it's, I don't know, still in the red, but it's not terrible, or if it's really off the chart bad. So if you see the LCP at like nine nine seconds, okay, like work with that. And if you if you if you're looking at you know, if you're seeing like like really serious ones, so start from the serious ones and then uh, go from there, right? Yeah, I mean it's it's also something where if it's if it's almost like at the end of the red in the sense that it's like almost in yellow, uh, then from from my point of view, I'd say. At least from a user point of view, it's not super critical. Okay. I, I would still look at that at some point, and maybe there's something like a sprint that you could do in between to kind of move that forward. Uh, but if you're seeing that the, the LCP is, I don't know, 30 seconds or 50 seconds or something like really crazy, then that does feel like something where even without the SEO aspect, your users will notice. And right. that, that does seem like something that's worth prioritizing. Uh, so that's, I, I don't know, ki kind of the way that I would look at it there. I think if you would ask the Chrome team, they would always say, like, oh, yeah, you should always do speed first. Uh, but uh, you have to find some kind of a practical middle ground. You don't have infinite resources. Uh, you, you don't have a team of 500 people who can just jump and do everything on your website. OK, I appreciate it. And I'll uh, take it and share it. So some some don't agree. Some. Just like okay, this is you know Google's really demanding in that area and so on. But uh, all right, thank you. Uh, sure. I'll let others uh, go ahead. Sure, cool. Uh, Tarun, I think. Hi, John. Uh, I have like Hi. three questions. Uh, the first question is about web stories. So let's say that like uh, we start a new site in the current scenario, like right now, and we focus only on web stories. Okay, we won't be putting all those long form content. Will it be a good idea to do that or? Or should we mix with like long form content and the traditional approach, and then we should consider web stories just as an add on thing or what? Like, so what's your recommendation on that? So web stories are essentially HTML pages in in using the AMP framework, uh, but usually they have a limited amount of content in them. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's something that we we can show them in the search results. We can show them in Discover. I. Don't know if it depends on the location, uh, on, on how we show them. We can always show them as normal HTML pages as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it might be something where having a, a certain mix of normal long form content and web stories uh, probably performs better overall. Uh, so if everything is, is this really short story format, then I mm -hmm. could imagine that it's trickier to rank for some queries just because you don't have room for a lot of different kind of content and variations of that content in a web story page. OK. Uh, OK, thanks, uh, John. The second question is, like, like let's say that uh, uh, we have a niche we have been working for the last 10 to 12 years, and we are doing pretty good in that particular niche. But, uh, but uh, our readers are asking to focus on other niche as well. Like, let's say that we were earlier working on technology. Now they are asking us to focus on automobile. Uh, on the same, uh, should we do it on the same site? Like, because we already have good traffic. And, and should we write? Let, let's say we are working on technology content for the last 13 years. They are asking us to write about automobile and or maybe like various other stuffs, you know? Because we do get a lot of comments from our readers. So, so how is going to Google uh, uh, look into that aspect? Like, whether should we do that or should we just jump into like a new website and start something out of it? Like, I don't know. It's it's hard to say, and it, it almost feels like more of a strategic question from from my point of view. I I think mm -hmm. like starting a new website is a lot of work, and mm -hmm. maintaining a new website is is a lot of extra work. So mm -hmm. usually my my recommendation when people ask like should I have more websites or fewer websites, I usually tell them. 
try to limit the amount of websites that you have and focus really on one really strong website rather than having multiple that are kind of mediocre. And mm -hmm. uh, that's something that I would say probably also applies here. Uh, but at the same time, if you're noticing that the audience is significantly different, then maybe mm -hmm. it does make sense to kind of split it off and say, this is a different website. So for example, if you are uh, selling furniture and you're selling that uh, directly to consumers, then that's, mm -hmm. that's a fantastic website to have. If you're suddenly also selling to uh, resellers or providing like, a, I don't know, white label furniture as well, then maybe mm -hmm. that's something you don't want to mix with the existing website. Uh, with regards to your content in your situation, if the existing users are saying they also want to see other content, then that mm -hmm. sounds like there's enough overlap there that having one website would work. Um, okay. So mm -hmm. that's no, that's kind of my take there. Okay. Uh, the last question is that like uh, these days I have been seeing that like whenever uh, like uh, I tend to enter some keyword on Google and I end up visiting a big website. And when I hit the back button, they take us to a dedicated page of that particular website rather than going back to Google. So is it, is it a good approach to do something for a publisher like us also? Like, No, that's terrible. Yep. I, I, I think that's like a terrible uh, user interaction okay. there to kind of hijack the back button mm -hmm. like that. And okay. it is, is something that also the web spam team sometimes does take action on. Uh, so if we okay. notice that websites are hijacking the back button like that, they they would try to step in and encourage them to not do that. Because it's kind of like okay. a, a sneaky redirect, I think we, we would see mm -hmm. that. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, thanks, John. Like, uh, that's sure. the best answers what I got. Thanks so much. Yep. Cool. Thanks a lot. OK, let yeah. me pause the recording here. Uh, I see there's still a bunch of hands raised. We, we can go through those as well after the recording stops. Uh, but uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, thanks for watching and sticking around until the end. Uh, if you'd like to join these in the future, I post the link to them a couple days before they happen in the community section of, of our YouTube channel. So take a look there. And as always, thanks for watching. And thanks for all of the good questions so far. All right, let's pause now.